the South Bank Show. Tonight we look at a rare screenwriting partnership which began with Lawrence of Arabia and has lasted 27 years. Sir David Lean and Robert Bolt. So David Lean and Robert Bolt are one of the great screenwriting partnerships. They've collaborated together on Lawrence of Arabia, Dr. Zhivago, Ryan's Daughter, and Mutiny on the Bounty, which was never made. And now, 26 years on, they're at it again. At 82, David Lean is planning to film an adaptation of Joseph Conrad's novel Nostromo, which is written with Robert Bolt. On the face of it, this is an unlikely partnership. David Lean is an instinctive filmmaker, a film man through and through. He began by literally sweeping the studio floor and went on to direct some of the biggest, the best, and certainly some of the most popular British films of the 50s and 60s. Brief Encounter, Oliver Twist, Bridge on the River Kwai. Robert Bolt, on the other hand, came into films via school teaching and the theatre. He's the author of A Man for All Seasons, and he was a notable left-wing intellectual. Furthermore, since their last collaboration, he's suffered a massive stroke. And it's a measure of his courage that today he can speak, let alone still work. Yet the combination of Lean's showmanship and excellence and quality and Bolt's high-minded approach to the cinema has proved to be a lasting one. When we heard they were working together again, we took the opportunity to look at this enduring partnership. We begin with the first fruit of their collaboration, Lawrence of Arabia, which opened 27 years ago. It's the complex story of a complex man, T.E. Lawrence, and his leadership of the Arab armies during World War I. It was produced by Sam Spiegel, directed by David Lean, of course, and starred Peter O'Toole as Lawrence. Last May, it was triumphantly re-released in a version restored to the cut that David Lean and Robert Bolt originally intended. Thank you very much for coming here tonight and filling this huge cinema to see a film I shot 27 years ago. But somewhere out there in the circle sits my old friend Robert Bolt. Believe it or not, Lawrence was the first film script he ever wrote. We made films of Dr. Zhivago, Ryan's daughter, and then out in the South Pacific working on the true story of the bounty. He was struck down by a terrible stroke. The doctors in Los Angeles said he'd never be able to speak or write again. They were wrong. Last week, he finished the screenplay of Joseph Conrad's Nostromo. If you can hear me out there in the projection box, please start dimming the lights and drawing back the curtains. Sam Spiegel and I were working with another writer on Lawrence of Arabia, and it, it, it wasn't working. The most curious thing, you know, it's rather writers, it's rather like casting actors. Some, sometimes they don't go with the subject in some curious way, you know? And uh, I said, Sam, it's not working. And then Sam said to me, baby, I think you better go and see Man for All Seasons. And I went and saw it, and of course, it bloody well written, you see. And Sam said, well, I tell you what, we'll give him a test. And we gave him a scene which had been disaster to date. And um, he went away and came back with about 10 pages. And of course, it was simply wonderful. What was <clears throat> those first 10 pages? What did you see? Uh, can you describe, uh, was it, uh, he just knew how to write? Yeah. Dialogue between two people, uh, and uh, Lawrence in, in, in was in it, of course, with one of the generals in Cairo, and uh, it was just it had a real style with it. You know, you can't fake this sort of thing. 
Lawrence, sir. Send him in. Good morning, sir. Salute. If you're insubordinate of me, Lawrence, I shall put you under arrest. It's my manner, sir. Your what? My manner, sir. It looks insubordinate, but it isn't really. Well, I can't make out whether you're bloody bad-mannered or just half-witted. I have the same problem, sir. Shut up. Yes, sir. Now, the Arab bureaus seem to think you would be of some use to them in Arabia. Why, I can't imagine. You don't seem able to perform your present duties properly. I cannot fiddle, but I can make a great state from a little city. What? For Mr. Cleese, sir, a Greek philosopher. I know you've been well-educated, Lawrence. It says so in your dossier. You're the kind of creature I can't stand, Lawrence. But I suppose I could be wrong. All right, Dryden, you can have him for six weeks. Who knows? Might even make a man of him. Well, it was very funny because, you see, Robert uh, was the schoolmaster. You know, he was the English master at Millfield. Very posh school. And being an intellectual, I was absolutely terrified of him because he reminded me of my brother, who was also an intellectual, and he used to say, my dear David, you really just cannot do that sort of thing, but I suppose you can in the movies. That sort of attitude, you know. And Robert had this sort of thing, you know, every now and again, he was very superior in those days. I think it was fear, probably. I'd like to say, sir, that I am grateful for this. Shut up and get out. Sir? Why were you snobbish about films to start with, Robert? Oh, God. I wonder. I just thought, coming from your background, you'd have been one of the less likely lads in the English theatre establishment to be snobbish. Oh, no, I wore very, very snobbish. Um, you... Um, I was right. Come to think, you see, if I have gone with anybody but David, they think that I wrote would have been tossed outside. I believe that you were brought up as a strict Methodist. Did that background, do you see that background having had an effect on your writing, the subjects you've chosen and the way you've written about them? Uh, yes, I do. Was uh, it a very strict Methodist? Were yes. You? Oh, awful. We went to church three times during Sunday. And when I was 16, my father said, now you are of a premium to to yourself. I said, I'm never going <laughs> into one of them. And he said, OK, and he never went back <laughs> to one. Have you been back since? No. <laughs> so this strict, deep Methodist background finished on your 16th right. birthday, just it like that? It is, <laughs> but you see, the, un the undertow of the morality, of the morality never left me. And you went on to join the Communist Party. Yes, of course. That would seem to me to come of not course. naturally out of the Methodist Church. Of course. The, do you think that those two, those two influences had uh, the subjects you tackled, the two together, or the Methodist Church more important or what? what oh, I see. Well, the two together form the doses of everything I wrote since. I think now this thing, this wrote, has rinsed me out of that. You think the stroke's taking you Yes. Right? Why? I don't know. I came several times near death. Yes. And that doesn't half wake you up when you come round and you say, hey, shut up, i got to think about this. <laughs> and so in what ways did you change after you'd come near oh. death with those strokes? Peasants. And 
a lovely dish of laughter. Look, Robert, let's recap. Where's Gould? The silver, I was afraid of that. Hmm? Yes. Stamps going. Yes. And we agreed just now that he'll come in. Right. In long shot. Right. Empty room, camp bed, sit. Yes. Hold it, stamp noise. Yes. Yes. Now, with or without the bag? With the bag. And he has got to have until the present out of it. I hate the idea of him. Or perhaps it's, perhaps it's stupid. What? Of him getting shot with a bag, holding the bag. I think the bag's going to bugger it up. Isn't it? Because the bag's going to yes. fall through. It should be right. absolutely simple. Yes. Black figure, white sand. Well, what does he do with the bag? Well, come on. He just goes and looks at the silver. OK. And Sure, he must go to the silver. Don't you agree? Well, I think he, yes, I think he well, might. Well, wait a minute. Yes, he, he must. Over 50 miles to London from the Atomic Weapons Research Establishment at Aldermaston in Berkshire. That's how more than 4,000 people spent the Easter holiday as a protest against the hydrogen bomb. In 1961, Robert Bolt, along with many other left-wing intellectuals, was arrested in Trafalgar Square while taking part in a demonstration for the campaign for nuclear disarmament. At the time, shooting had started on Lawrence of Arabia, but Bolt hadn't yet finished the script. So I believe the first big significance is that it is a mighty upsurge of democratic protest against the military dictatorship. Against the military dictatorship. Well, we hadn't finished the script. This was Lawrence. Yeah. And uh, the first thing, I mean, I met Sam Spiegel one morning, and he was looking as if something, if he'd been hit in the back. <laughs> and I really? said, what is it? <laughs> he said, he's been arrested. I said, who's been arrested? He says, he's been arrested with Bertrand Russell, the silly ass goes and lies down in the street at Aldermaston or wherever it was, you see, and sure enough, he was in prison. And Robert asked me up when he came out, because Sam got him out. Sam would get anybody out of anywhere, including himself. And uh, he asked me, he said, look, David, was that necessary? Would the film have stopped if I'd stayed in prison? I said, of course it would. It isn't finished. Undisciplined. Unpunctual. Untidy. Several languages, knowledge of music, literature, knowledge of, knowledge of. You're an interesting man, there's no doubt about it. So what attracted you to Lawrence of Arabia? What was your basic attraction to the subject? I didn't have one, you know. I rebutted him as a fascist. You thought he was a fascist? Yes. That must have been quite interesting for you at the time. Well, yeah, well, I read his book and I thought he is not a fascist. He is a romantic fascist. And I said, what 
kind of man would it be who fought in the first world war with has left that in prison on him and he has the piece of heroism and the cross of nobility and of course he was a gang ringer for my kind of hero it would seem on the surface that uh, you were two very different people you were uh, uh, extremely literary uh, known to be politically engaged david was a man of uh, tremendous uh, uh, instinctive intelligence right. now what was it that brought you together then and has stuck you together one way or another ever since i really don't know make me think you see, we often disagree about the political contents of the films. Of course, it is always his who wins. Almost always. Um, but I think that what downed us together was a thing the size of the characters were blown up tremendously like a Siberian yeah. character you know and he for he brought this out of me uh, do you understand i think so what you're saying is that he, he he lives in a world of very grand shakespearean and very often heroic characters yeah and that was something your you and your writing responded to right even but though you he doesn't live in that world he you Vanging that world. He invents it, yeah. Mm. Linda coming. No, now look, mm -hmm. I have an idea here. Good, it, good. What? <laughs> may be wrong, but they think that he is dead. They what? They think that he is dead. Who does? Well, Giselle? Yes. Now, how you got that old paper? I yes, I gave... yes. <laughs> What? Well, I... <laughs> I hope you liked it. I sent half the night forting this out. Oh, you have found it. Good heaven, give it to me. Don't let him see it. Oh, thank you very much. No. <laughs> you, uh, okay. Okay. Oh, good. I'm glad you got that top line in. I've always liked that. I thought you would think it was horrible. Now, Look at the first three lines. That's what I am. <laughs> <laughs> there have been times when we could not bear to speak to one another. I remember one point in Dr. Dimbargo and we make for three days and neither of us said anything. <laughs> Should have made a silent movie, Robert. <laughs> we have not got the lights. <laughs> <laughs> we have a very free... Um, we have a very free relationship together in work, particularly. 
You know, we can say anything and uh, we spark off each other, which is very exciting because he somehow excites me and I can't quite describe that either. He sets the adrenaline going. I mean, you have to be pretty bright to cope with Robert. And uh, I don't consider myself terribly bright. <laughs> and so I'm up there at once. And um, it somehow works. And I enjoy it. That's the great thing. You are the only friend I have. And he turned around and he said, I never dreamed of Father Burden, and they come into Morningham and Mrs. Gould, and he said, Morningham, much known though, have been shot. I don't see how it could be much shorter than that. Yes. Mm. You see, do you not like the good night? You are the only friend I have. Oh, okay. <laughs> ah, fucking hell. I'm going to sleep <laughs> tomorrow night. <laughs> You once said to me, um, people see my films and they say, oh, I didn't expect that. Oh, that, oh that's, that's strange. And you say, they should, if, they, if they've read the script, everything's in the script, which was one of the things you said. It's all there in the script. Do you actually like the whole thing to be there, everything you're going to do on paper, in your head, before you even start? And how does that affect the writing of it? I do, you know, uh, um, and one, uh, I, I tell you why, because when you're making a movie, as you know, I mean, even just us two sitting here, I mean, there are people all around us, you know, and with a movie, it's a huge, I always call it a circus. It is like a traveling circus, last of the traveling circuses. And you are trying to do something which is really very fine pencil work amidst hammering lights sound, every goddamn thing, oh, the sun's come out, or it's gone in, or whatever it is. And the hub and actors, who, of course, require a lot of attention. And um, there is such a lot going on that I find one of the most difficult jobs is to remember what Robert and I thought of when we conceived the scene. Very good, cut it. That looks very Very good, Mickey. The dust was almost perfect. What are we trying to say in that scene where Lawrence and Faisal meet in Faisal's tent at the beginning of his yes. adventure? What were you, as a screenwriter, what were you saying there? No. Well, the first thing is that London's by the whole campaign of the out of army, and he said that to Prince Faisal, and Faisal said, ah, but what if you cling on to with when the war is over? My lord, I think, I think your book is right. The desert is an ocean in which no oar is dipped. And on this ocean, the Bedou go where they please and strike where they please. This is the way the Bedou has always fought. You're famed throughout the world for fighting in this way. And this is the way you should fight now. Oh, I don't know. I'm sorry, sir, but you're wrong. Fall back on Yenbo, sir. And the Arab Rising becomes one poor unit in the British Army. What is this to you? Lawrence, do you know you're a traitor? No, no, Colonel. I... He is a young man, and young men are passionate, but they must say their say. Well, I tell you, the first thing I remember about that scene is I was about to shoot it. I, it's a very, very complicated camera. 
business, and it looks very simple, but it isn't. Why is it complicated? Uh, What's the complication? Well, I tell you what. First of all, I have Peter here, say, and Faisal here. And then I move Faisal, and he talks in profile. Then in the same shot, Faisal goes over there, and he goes completely out of focus intentionally, and, and so forth and so on. Well, my father is old, and I... I long for the vanished gardens of Cordoba. However, before the gardens must come the fighting. To be great again, it seems that we need the English or... Or? What no man can provide, Mr. Lawrence. We need a miracle. Faisal said, what we want is what no man can provide. We need a miracle, Mr. Lawrence, or where's that effect? And Peter goes outside, and the tent's beginning to, begins to creak in the wind. And I started on his footprints in the sand, and it was a wonderful day, shot day for night. Wonderful day when the strong wind, the sand blowing off these dunes, and clouds going by across him. And I walked Peter away, slowly walking away, and he was thinking, now what? How can we do it? How can we do it? So you have tremendously intimate thoughts, which the audience knows about, combined with a very rough, but also beautiful landscape. And it ends with Peter sitting there with two boys, rather artificial composition, with Peter sitting on the left of the screen, the two boys, two Arab boys, just looking, not understanding him. And behind it, I had a wind machine about oh, 300 yards away, blowing sand, and there was a hell of a great wind. And the, so in the foreground, you've got two boys still, Peter still holding onto a, a, a thing of stone. And the only movement is this sweeping dust blowing across the background. Now, that's in direct contrast, and let's face it, drama is contrast, to these inner thoughts. And he's holding this thing. He says, Akaba, to the boys, Akaba, from the land. Akaba. Akaba, from the land. And that's the end of the scene. And it's contrast, you see. I mean, you could, I suppose, have had him sit inside a tent and do exactly the same, but it wouldn't have been the same as this violence of nature carrying on and very loud music building up. And I was very pleased with that. The only trouble was, I remember Robert saying at the time, he's squeezing this rock, little bit of rock, until the blood starts coming out of his hand. And I thought that was going a bit too far. I didn't. I could have done that in close-up. It would have looked jolly good. I funked it. Why do you think you funked it? Over the top. You're always terrified of going over the top on the scene. I mean, already the idea was a bit outlandish, sort of staying in the desert all night and just thinking, if I think hard enough, I can think of a solution. Blood. Akaba. And you've got it, you know. I think it, uh, it, it, I, I messed it up, but it looked all right still. Do you have a strong visual imagination? Yes. And is that a help yes. when you're working together? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. I mean, do you see, when you're talking about a scene, you say, um, do you see it in a room or in a, with a big landscape behind it? And it's not a oh, landscape yes. in these films. That, that, or, I mean, oh, of course, yes, I see all that. And I see the tiny little thing, like the rods building out the match. You yes. know? And then the sunrise. Right. Yeah. That is part of my thing. <laughs>
I don't think either of us could say who thought of what. Robert's always saying this. And because it's sort of building bricks, I mean, he'll say, look, what about, I mean, we'll know what we're going, trying to do, but how to crack it is the thing. How about this? They collapse, but I throw him something and he throws it back to me and I'll throw him back, you know? And I think it's wonderful if Mitchell hurries up and you come down, we come down with her mm. and see him there in the corner. Very good. It is good, it's much better. Okay. You know, Robert, and let's get, you know, I think this idea of the only friend she's got, which is true, will be much, much better right at the end, when they say goodnight. But we'll see. It's a very tricky yeah. thing. We've got so many things going at yeah. once. Okay, lovely. Sorry. No, lovely. Mm. Let's have a rest, I can have a coffee. I think film, as you see, are very different from, from stage, or indeed from writing a novel, because there are very few, I think it's got to be a collaboration. Do you see what I mean? Mum's up there. Mum's up there, and we end here. Until the great genius, which will appear one day, he hasn't appeared yet, in my opinion. I think the nearest you've got is Orson. And Citizen Kane he got bloody near it, didn't he? And and but someday somebody's going to come along. I know they aren't. What am I doing now? It's in the script, and, and we haven't got them. Who can write and also know as much about that thing keep going, keep it going, keep it going. as he does about writing and he'll be a virtuoso performer yeah that's it now do it once for him i can't operate it's mostly a collaborative job i think i happen to have a sort of good pair of eyes i really enjoy looking through a camera Gives me a real pleasure. You know, we could go on like this all day. Right, print the one before, let's go to lunch. And to frame the composition a bit up here, a bit up there, and trying to get your dark hair against the light background or whatever it is, gives me a real sensual pleasure. I can't explain it really any more than that. I just love it. Can we uh, talk a bit more about um, working together with, uh, with, with David Lane? We're, you, what do you do? You write one scene, two scenes, three scenes, half the script, take it back to him, work together? Just done. Of course, I really write it about four times before we are both satisfied with it. And of course, it is David who must be satisfied with it. Because if he is not satisfied, he doesn't shoot it. <laughs> <coughs> yes, nothing like knowing where the power is in that. Of is course, there, really? yes. of course. Do you sometimes resent that? Yes. What do you do about it then? Nothing. Is he a hard man to persuade? No, he is not. Um, 
you can persuade him about four things of the way, and the final things he won't come along with. Do you have any um, clashes or views on... You're a, you're a very literary writer. Oh, yeah. God, why do you say that? Well, it I... happens to be an opinion I hold, but I mean... I, I... <laughs> <laughs> I can drop it, but I can't retract. OK. Um, and David works um, as Spielberg and everybody else keeps pointing out quite rightly. Um, very, very much inside film. He started as a film, and yes. uh, he's a film man, in yes. that sense, which seems on the surface to be anti-long speeches. Um, is there any tension there, or is it a very nice compliment? No. Oh, that is a complete compliment. I, I love the long speeches. I, of course, I can occasionally write them, but I love them. So you like the way he deals with your long speeches? Yes. Uh, no, no, no. <laughs> I like the way I deal with <laughs> them. i tell you what I don't like about uh. it. I think it's far too literary. <laughs> I wanted and... to make it old tender a month. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> OK. Go on. And I think it should be terribly stark. Oh, well. Well, pictorially it'll be stark, Robert. You know, and it's such a shocking scene. You know, it's all this morning becomes a lecture stuff, and, and I don't believe that when he's dying, I just don't think you think in those terms at a moment like that, do you? No. I don't think, I, don't. I know what you were doing. You were trying to make me very happy, I know. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Giovanni, you are not like other men. Oh, lovely. Yeah, I know it's lovely, Robert, but no. not here. I don't think you... you if a man's dying, I think all you do is to look after him. And I don't believe Linda would, you know, she, he was mine before before you were born. Oh. It's like uh, sort of being, I think, oh, shut up. Can you see anything in common between... Um, the f anything in common with the films you've worked on him with? Is there, is, is there, is there, a, is there a sort of recognisable, bold, lean symbiosis going on there? <laughs> Well, they are all about a man who, like the messages, forces himself against the times. They're all about a man like the man right. forcing himself against the times, yes. The, one of the uh, things which emerges in these films is the... Um, contradiction or the opposition between a, a man's animal nature and his moral aspirations. Yes, oh yes. Or his ideals. And that opposition is seen very clearly in the scene that you wrote in Schwager with Lara, Pasha and Karamowski in the oh, cafe. Yes. When he says he's going to marry her. A good scene that was. <laughs> <laughs> what was good about it? Camarosity. He... He made that a plea for the early man nature in man, and he said, "This is the man that the world expects to despise, but in fact, it does not." I don't have a look at. My chief impression is, and I mean no offense, is that you're very young. Monsieur Komarovsky, I hope I don't offend you. Do people improve with age? They grow a little more tolerant. Because they have more to tolerate in themselves. If people don't marry young, what do they bring to their marriage? A little experience. I'm 26. My mother died needlessly when I was eight. My father died in prison. I have fended for myself. 
I've worked my way through higher school and university. I am familiar with things that you can hardly guess at. All this is an experience of a kind, certainly. I've no amorous experience, if that's what you mean. None whatever. Lara's 17. That speaks for itself. You probably find this situation comic. We don't. We're going to be married next year. As far as I'm concerned, it was one of the scenes that were a failure in the film. I can't even tell you why, but I remember being very dissatisfied with it. I thought it could have been, have many more layers to it than it in fact had on the screen. What's missing? A kind of uh, wickedness of Komarovsky. I mean, he's there with these two young people and she, in a curious sexual way, is bound to this wretched, terrible man, Komarovsky. And he's kind of maneuvering the two of them. And I don't think that comes out of the scene at all. My fault. Why is it your fault? I should have directed it better. How would you have directed it better? Maybe in the setups, maybe in the way Rod Steig had played it. I'm trying to think of what we would have done to change the setups, David. Oh, I should have I, uh, probably more close-ups, so that you can see the thoughts whizzing about between the three of them. You know. And it was sort of detached. I didn't even like the set. I wasn't very happy with that scene. And the curious thing, I don't think the scene was one of Robert's best. But could you talk about constructing that scene? And uh, why did you say, because I know it's a very <clears throat> important scene to you. We, and why yes. it's so important to you and how you said about it. And it's, it's quite short and elegantly neat. And so so what, what, what's going on there? Oh. <clears throat> Well, you would see a, a, a very complicated scene. You would see Komorowski is of the Sudan country. Is it the Sudan country? Yes, yeah, sure. With Rala. And she thinks that she has won him over. And then Persia comes and he thinks he has rung him over. He said, you know, I was like this when I was a student. <coughs> and then he takes Larda back to her tiny little room and he round on her and he said, there are two kinds of men, and only two. And that young man is one kind. He is high-minded. He is pure. He's the kind of man that the world pretends to look up to and, in fact, despises. He is the kind of man who breeds unhappiness, particularly in women. Do you understand? No. I think you do. There's another kind. Not high-minded, not pure, but alive. Now that your taste at this time should incline towards the juvenile is understandable. But for you to marry that boy would be a disaster. Because there's two kinds of women. There are two kinds of women, and you, as we well know, are not the first kind. You, my dear, are a slut. I am not. We'll see. And he rates her, and he goes out of the door, and he said the one line in the film, which is the key line, he said... And don't delude yourself, this was rape. That would flatter us both. He mean you and do it too. Why do you think that that's the key line in the film? Ah. That was the whole point of the film. Everything else comes from that. And a matter of that, 
the that was what was wrong with the company revolution or revolutions think that they are did by the force of moral example above that and it was not so it's a massive it's a massive screenplay <clears throat> and when we talked to robert about it um he um he said he saw that the that thing one of the things that a central thing that appealed to him about the story was a, it's a conflict between man's animal nature and his moral nature that's one of the ways robert put it what what do you, what what's your response to that but i don't see it in those terms you see i saw it as a very good story and i'll leave the morals <laughs> to robert but uh, i suppose you know when you come i suppose that is it yes yes i suppose that's right but you know perhaps that's rather really why we work so well because uh, I'm first and foremost interested in a story, the characters, and the way I'm going to put it up there on the screen, the pictures I'm going to flip up. And Robert, of course, is, th is thinking in a much more interior way. It's my brother again, you see, the intellectual versus the <laughs> whatever you'd like to describe me as, you know. And I sp he must be right, I suppose. I never thought of it in those terms. Of course it is when you come to think of it, but um, I never consciously sat on the set and thought, now this is the part where there's the great moral tug. I think if I did, it would have been, have been disaster. What do you bring him then? Well, my idea of what the fault is about, uh, he leans on me tremendously, but if he does not agree, he said no. I don't agree. First, wait me of this. And you see, now, this is a thing we always class about. Always. He thinks that the half of the actor will explain anything. I don't. He thinks the heart of the actor. Like yes. But just the... The love interest. Yes. I don't. But I think that is probably my mistake. But I still don't. <laughs> David Lean and Robert Bolt's current project, Joseph Conrad's Nostromo, is the story of another complicated man a dashing mercenary who's both noble and revealed as a trickster. Do you see Nostromo as a, uh, a character who uh, is part of the as it were, the cast of people you've made films about. You see him a bit like Lawrence, a bit like Zhivago. Well, he's a flawed hero, yeah. and I love flawed heroes. I mean, River Kwai had one, and uh, over oh, numerous flawed heroes. Lawrence, I suppose. Uh, and uh, I think this is a rather extraordinary one. Uh, different kettle of fish. Oh. Robert <laughs> likes villains. You see, and I think that if you are doing a villain on the screen, you've got to have a sneaking regard for him. Okay. Robert has, and I have. I think it's very important. Not that you'd want to have dinner with him every day, every evening. Really? <laughs> I mean, I can't tell you how hard that is to do with one hand like that. And not that you don't disapprove of him, but. You kind of enjoy <laughs> the wickedness instead of being repelled by it. Oh, fucking hell. And if you are repelled, I think you're probably in trouble. Yeah. And Robert <laughs> writes those sort of people that you're not repelled by. You are at moments shocked, of course. 
but he's wonderful at that. All right. <laughs> and he's a... <laughs> very creature of opposites, you see. He's a very tender man. Deep down. He can think like a 16-year-old girl. <laughs> well, is there anything else you want to say about working with David Robert? Hmm. Yes, you know, I don't know quite what to say. He is a first right person to work. Ball. And then one comes up again a little knuckle, and you can't get through it. I tried, you can't nod. Well, you're probably right, Robert. I would well, I, I tell you what, I would love him to walk stealthily. Yes. Of course. I think that's terribly important. Of course. So that we feel that. Yes. There's something right. more than what of we're course, seeing going course. on, and I don't quite know how to do that. That's the truth of it. You're confident I'm not. Why can't she get out of the window? Because, they are Robert, to I... Devda. She hopes. She doesn't know. She doesn't know he's coming. She knows. Yes, well, okay, okay. But you know, I tell you what I think so good, Robert, is Linda's static up there in the lighthouse. Yes. yes. The girl is just moving. He's the only moving figure. And I think she should be kind of Let look, it go. Yep. looking, okay. at, looking yep. at him. Yep. Yep. And he gets nearer and nearer and nearer and click, bang. You Good. know, and Lovely. if she jumps out of the window, it spoils that yes. kind of pattern. Right. Okay. Okay. Look, I think we're pretty well there, actually. Have um, you got that? I think I, think I can do that. That's about it. <laughs>